leadership, 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 success, success, success. Hi, my name is Jonathan Medina. I'm America's number one youth motivator. I'm your teacher, I'm your coach, I'm your friend, and I'm your teammate. And today we have an amazing guest. We have Mario Trevino. Just to let you know a little bit about him, some of his recent success. He recently lost 70 pounds so he could be qualified to go to his dream university of going to West Point. Um, he also helped his family renew their faith. He's been very involved in helping his father find success in his business. And of course, he is at his dream school at the uh, West Point Academy. Please help me welcome our guest, Mario Trevino. I just told everyone about all of your success as a leader. I told them how you recently lost the 70 pounds so you can attend uh, West Point, which is a dream school, I'm sure for you and for many others. Um, and so they learned about this amazing success, but can you tell us how you first got started? Can you tell us about some of the activities, some of the leadership things that you did maybe while you're in the middle school, high school? Yeah, so um, some of the leadership activities I did, you know, were just, you know, being student council president, being a member of National Honor Society, just really trying to put myself out there and put myself in a position where failure, you know, wasn't an option. That, that was kind of my biggest thing because my dad always told me, if you do everything in your power to, you know, get what you want, then, you know, life will, life will give it to you. So that's just a mindset I've always had since, you know, middle school, then throughout high school. And even in high school, I was student council president. I mean, you know, captain of the football team. I've been blessed to, you know, be in those, in those positions, you know, basketball team as well. Uh, it was just great experiences. Yeah, and uh, so the people out there, they may not know that your dad is also, he or he was a football coach. Um, so I think some of the language that you used right away um, is definitely, you know, when you're in athletics or when um, now I'm sure maybe they use language like that now that you're at the military academy, but uh, taking the opportunities, going and seizing the moments. Um, I, I love all that kind of language. I myself, of course, was a football player. So that just speaks right to my heart, to my soul uh, and to my experience. Um, what were the first clubs? So you did, uh, I guess, athletics since you were in middle school. Um, did you do yes, the sir. other ones like student council since you were in middle school? Yes, sir. Um, and on the athletic side in middle school, I was always a three, four sport athlete, you know, uh, basketball, football, track, um, you know, just trying to better myself for football. That was the ultimate goal. I always thought football was going to be my way out. And, you know, I was, I'll get a scholarship, you know, I'll go that route, but God just had different plans for me and, you know, it still worked out perfectly. You know, I'm not complaining, but, you know, it's just when that moment happens where, you know, your original plan is taken away from you, how are you going to respond to that? And how are you going to use that as motivation and energy to, you know, pursue the next avenue of life? And that's just something that's always spoken to me in volume just because I've lived through it, you know, and it's just great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I myself um, ended up going to college and, and didn't participate at playing college football, but um, I actually did not see myself until I started being recruited. I, I didn't realize that, you know, me being my size and, and having the athleticism, the speed that I had for someone my size um, made it where I was easily qualified to play college football. But um, I always found that, um, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're at West Point, so you have to have this certain academic standard to go to a school like that. Um, I always kind of one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to make sure um, there's a lot of kids who maybe they they only have the athletic part, but they don't work on the academic side. And so I was trying to make sure that I was going to have my way of getting to that next level, no matter what, I wasn't going to just rely on athletics, but I was going to have the academics. So I applaud you for for all the, the success you've had academically um, to, to qualify. So I don't think a lot of people uh, maybe they don't know that uh, to get into a school like West Point, it, it's at the highest standard. It's like going to an Ivy League level type. So can you tell us about what it was like in the application process to go to West Point? Hi, yes, sir. It was, it was very rigorous. That's for sure. Um, let me just tell you this. Uh, we had to have a congressional nomination. So from a congressional nomination, they only choose two people from their district. And me being in South Texas, you know, I was blessed to be one of the two but it was it's just very competitive so you know yeah the application process started the fall of my junior year the fall of my junior year you know I needed to start my CFA which is the cadet fitness assessment so you need to be physically in shape 
to adhere to the standards that the military academy you know makes you keep and so then academically as well I wasn't the best student just because I'd always relied on you know football so like you said I applaud you for that that's that's big being able to you know use that passion and just kind of resonate to all aspects of life but so for me it started a little earlier than most people just because I was 270 pounds you know my ACT score was a 20 I was coming from a school where the average ACT score was a 16 so I was there were a lot of outside factors but I never let that you know bother me so my sophomore year after going through a back I felt I was being redirected by God you know I can't pursue football you know what else am I going to do my uncle put this little bug in my ear hey have you thought about West Point and ever since then, I just ran with it. I lost the weight. You know, I moved up 30 slots in my class ranking, um, improved my ACT score to 28. And it's just, if you want something bad enough, you're going to get it. So let me just go through the West Point application process. Once again, I just wanted everyone to have a little background on me. Um, so the first thing that I had to go through was just submitting the questionnaire, right? So if you're good enough on the questionnaire, then they'll send you something to apply. So you, it wasn't even, you know, it was just, okay, here's a questionnaire, maybe you'll apply, you know? So I submitted my questionnaire, got that in, they sent me the application, they said, okay, here you go. And right away, there were about 20 slots of things I needed to do. One of them, get a congressional nomination, get five letters of recommendation, you know, three from teachers, and then two from, you know, other individuals that, may see you in, in high standard. And, you know, when I saw that, I'm not gonna lie to you. It was, it was, you know, it was a lot to take in for a 16 year old, 17 year old kid. You know, I had to do all this stuff. I had to travel all these places, learn all this information. And, you know, one thing that I noticed, I learned and I'm still using it to this day is just, you can only do one thing at a time, take it like that and you'll be fine. But like you said, uh, the academics there is very rigorous. You know, you need to be captain of teams in high school. I mean, there are very impressive people there and I'm just lucky to be around those individuals because I believe, you know, iron sharpens iron. So it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I love all that. Now you use some of my favorite quotes in that, in that little moment, but if you were to give a, some advice, a tip to someone who maybe they're in middle school, maybe they're in high school and they're just getting started to be involved in clubs, organizations, maybe they just joined a team for the first time. What would be a tip for someone who is just getting started? Don't be afraid to fail. You know, that's one of the biggest things because inevitably you're going to find your passion by failing. And with using that passion, you could use it in all aspects of life. So you're not one dimensional. But one of the biggest things is don't be afraid to fail. I mean, I failed so many times throughout my life, you know, whether it's football, I'm sure you understand that, you know, you fail in football, you know, almost every day, but you come back with the mindset that I'm going to be better because failure doesn't define you, but it's, you know, coming back from that failure and doing better. That's what people look at at the end of the day. I mean, I feel that's just our American spirit and it's big because there are people that are afraid to fail and, you know, I'm not one to judge, but if you're afraid to fail and put yourself out there, you know, you're hindering what your potential could be. And that's the part that I'm afraid a lot of people are taking nowadays just because they don't like to be criticized, you know, but I would feel that's, that's the biggest thing. Just don't be afraid to fail and pursue what you want, you know, with a passion that no one can match. I mean, we're only in this world for a limited amount of time. I always tell myself, you know, Max, I have about 60 years left, you know, God willing. So I'm going to use those 60 years, you know, to make something out of myself to do better than my parents did. And, you know, that's just something that's always in me and doing something when you don't want to do it, there's power in that. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I always think you brought up football. I always think of how, um, no matter what position you play at some point, not only do you fall, but you get knocked down in football. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no <laughs> problem with it's expected that at some point you're going to fall, you're going to be knocked down, you're going to stumble, you will be tackled, maybe you get blocked all the way into the ground. People fall in football. And then we all have the opportunity to get back up. And it's the same thing, whether it's the football field, or whether it's any other aspect of life, we, we fall, and then we have to get back up go back out there again. 
Um, and so I, I, always, I love that advice of don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of falling. Um, so thank you so much for that advice. Now, um, is there a mistake that maybe you've made or you've seen someone else make in their leadership that you would tell someone to avoid a certain mistake in leadership? Sir, most definitely. I like, I love that question. Um, <clears throat> there is something that people confuse, you know, leadership with micromanagement a lot of the times, you know, I'm seeing this a lot now being at this school and it's great because you're able to see how different people lead and, and you're able to see what you don't want to do and what you do want to do. So one thing I feel as a leader is you need to adhere to your personality, you know, so you can't force yourself to be someone you're not. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to work out. That's just not who you are and that's okay. But one of the biggest things that I always see is that people want to micromanage other individuals and, you know, to the point where it's, you know, it's regressing the, the subordinate's ability to do, you know, good things. And at the same time, this is something that, you know, one of my mentors taught me, Lieutenant Colonel Fight, he really helped me get into West Point. And um, he said, you need to have people chase the standards, but you can't have standards chase the people. So what that means is, you know, as soon as you go in there, you need to set it clear that, you know, these are the standards, meet them, maintain them. And, you know, if you meet them, you maintain them, we're all good, you know, just adhere to what I'm saying, you know, I'll treat, treat people like individuals, you know, at our core, I feel that we've all gone through something, we all have some commonality between us, whether, you know, me being Hispanic, someone else being Caucasian, African American, we've all gone through something where we could relate and sympathize, maybe even empathize with each other. So just understanding that the back of your head, you know, there are people, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, gee, I wonder how I could mess up, you know, this, for, you know, no, no one does that. I mean, it's just unheard of. So just understanding that we are all people adhering to your personality for leadership. And that's through trial and error that goes back to not being afraid to fail. And then just setting the standard and maintaining it. And you as a leader, you need to go above and beyond that. So I feel that's why they say in order to be a good leader, you need to be a good follower. And those are just some of the biggest things that scream to me, you know, about leadership. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about uh, not being a micromanager, uh, I think, I don't know if the term, if I'm going to get it right or wrong, but uh, I was listening to a podcast, happened to be a military guy. Uh, I've read a couple of his books. Uh, his name is Jocko. And Willing he, oh, yeah. Yeah. Jocko Willingham, uh, Willingham or Willingham. But he, he talks about, I think it's decentralized command, I think is the word that he used. Um, but he talks about how, you know, once it goes out, then the next person is in charge of things. And then they're not micromanaging each other. It's just like, okay, you're in charge of that. I can trust you. I believe you, you're going to get it done. And so, you know, they have command at their point. And then they, it kind of just keeps on going down the line. Um, and so then that, you know, that's how they're using it at, at ultra, listen, like Navy SEAL guy, right? So, um, and same thing in professional athletes, you know. I was just watching football games last night and, you know, the, the coach calls a play and he expects all the players to just go execute the play. And then um, the guy that's next to the next guy is expecting everyone's going to do their job. Um, and when everyone's doing their job, it all runs well. Right. And so we all find sure. success when we're all just executing on our own individual parts. Now, how has a coach or a mentor um, really benefited you? How have they helped you? How have they influenced you? Um, and it could be in any aspect. Wow. This is big, you know, because I always say I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. You know, there's so many people that have helped me and it's crazy. I mean, just off the top of my head, I mean, whether it's helping me to get into West Point or just helping me by putting challenges in front of me, you know, it's all, it's all the same to me because those challenges, I pick things that I use on my path getting to West Point and, you know, just further my career. But uh, so just one mentor I could think, you know, of course, my parents, they've always been there for me. But, you know, that's kind of just a given that they've always done that. So I would say one person is, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Shane Fight. I mean, he's always, you know, giving me that perspective that, you know, there's more that needs to be done. You know, for my sophomore year, this is a funny story, actually. I came in his office at 270 right after Christmas break because I just had my back surgery. Uh, two herniated discs. I had a laminectomy. Um, so I came in his office, barely being able to walk. And I said, hello, sir. You know, I'm Mario Trevino. Nice to meet you. I would like to join JROTC because I want to go to West Point. 
you know, I just set myself out there. Not, you know, my ACT was a 20 at the time. My class ranking wasn't where it needed to be to want to go to a school like that. But, you know, I feel that's just because of my faith. I feel, you know, like my dad said, if you want something bad enough, you're going to get it. And so sure enough, I go in there and he looks at me and he says, okay, let's get after it. Signed up for JROTC that same day. Um, and since then, he's just been molding me, shaping me, you know, giving me perspective along the way that I've just been carrying with me throughout my life. I mean, there were some times where, you know, things got tough. I wasn't able to lose weight. You know, the ACT, getting that up wasn't looking good. And, you know, he'd always just say, say things like, man, I don't know how you're going to handle those winners up there in New York. And I was just, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, wow, he has this much faith in me. You know, I have to honor his sacrifice of, you know, pouring this much dedication and commitment to a kid that he barely even knows. And, you know, sure enough, we have a great relationship now. I met him the other day at Arby's and you know, we just sat down, talked, ate, uh, ate some food. And, um, but no, without him, he says that, you know, I didn't get you into West Point. You did it yourself, but I still like to just look at it and say, you know, without him, it wouldn't have been possible at all. I mean, I've just been blessed to have, such a great mentor in my life, you know? Yeah. And I think it's so important for us to have people that believe in us and are willing to support us. Cause like you said, it, there are some hard times. And I think sometimes having that, some, that person to lean on, or, or it sounds like um, the, the Colonel, he was willing to push you forward. Um, maybe even a little aggressively by, by giving you that hard <laughs> challenge, but, but sometimes that's what we need. And so having someone just like that um, is so important for all of us to have that success. Um, so I'm glad that you had him there on your and your parents, of course, and all the support that you get. Now, can you can you help us to you know I, I love hearing the stories of, of when people get accepted. Um, so when you found out that you were accepted into West Point, what was that moment like? To, to put us paint the picture, what was what was it like in the room, or were you do you open up your laptop and see an email, open a letter? How did it happen for you? I remember like it was just yesterday. Wow, you're gonna get me. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so I was actually in Dallas because I, I was a state officer for Business Professionals of America. I was blessed to be a part of uh, that organization. Great people, great individuals. You know, I loved it every second. But we were in Dallas getting ready for the state leadership conference, right? And let me put this in perspective. You know, I'm kind of going to branch out a quick bit. I had been disqualified in December for my back. They said, you know, yeah. We see you want to come, but, you know, your back surgery, that's, you know, it is what it is. So I applied for a waiver. I was very discouraged at that point, as you can imagine. You know, I lost 70 pounds. I got my ACT score up. I was very discouraged. They disqualified. And, you know, my colonel told me, hey, man, you know, it's not over. You know, just stay the course. You have the waiver. Just see how it goes. So sure enough, that waiver took about three months. And to the day, it was March 2nd. I believe when I saw it, because we were up there for a state leadership conference, we were going to a 7-Eleven in downtown Dallas, right? We were walking. I was checking my portal every day, right? Checking it every day. And um, we were there. We were just picking up some stuff. I remember what I bought, actually. It was black water. I mean, my friends were just goofing around. I was like, okay, let's see what this is about. Then I just opened up my phone just to see because I just kind of had that habit of always going onto the portal tracking. And sure enough, off the bottom right hand corner, it says you have been accepted, accept or decline acceptance. I I was breath, I didn't know what to say. It took my breath away. You know, I accepted <laughs> on the dot um, screenshot to my parents, to uh, Colonel. So, you know, Mr. and Mr. Ramos, they really helped me as well. I mean, Coach Burgett, I mean, just, you know, I, I just let it, you know, people that have been there for me. And, you know, I was just excited and words couldn't express my gratitude, my excitement. It was, it was great, great experience. How did your parents react? Because uh, oh. I know your, your mom was former military also. So, that, you know, that's, that's got to be really cool and really amazing for her to see. Her <laughs> son is now at the top level at one of the academies. Uh huh. No, my mom's, my parents were ecstatic. They, um, they saw the, I wasn't going to be home for another week, but they saw the package come in. They wanted to open it. And I was like, no, like, 
you know, I want to open it. <laughs> it was that type of thing, but it was great. I mean, I was, uh, it, it was, I'm happy you asked that question. It's been a, it had been a while since I relived that and, you know, it feels good thinking about it. No, no, that that's for me, that was that same, uh, it was similar, but not, I, I got a few denial letters before I got into, oh, wow. uh, when I, when I opened the Georgetown letter, it was almost relief because the fear had been, I had just been denied to Harvard and Princeton and Yale the week mm -hmm. before. And so I opened the Georgetown letter and I finally get accepted. To it was it. wow. And but, how'd you uh, feel? If you don't mind me asking, how, how did you feel at that moment? Well, I, I ended up doing it by myself. So the first time I opened the letter, people were around me and they, they got to see the tears come down my eyes when of well, the disappointment of not getting in. I wanted to go to Princeton. I, I was, I spent a summer there. The coaches called me every week. I thought I was a, a shoe in for Princeton. I, I had had um, like dinner with some of the high people in the university. Um, so I thought I was like, oh, I'm getting in and uh, got denied. And so I start crying or whatever. So next week I see the letter in the mail. Uh, my grandfather was a migrant field worker, so he wasn't home. Uh, he was out working in the fields. I, I would kind of wait for him and then he picked me up and I go help him. Uh, so I'm, I'm at home alone. I go check the mail and then the letter's there. And it takes me a while. I was, and I, I didn't accidentally click it on my phone because of habit. I, I was just sitting there and I was like, do I open it? Um, and it wasn't a huge letter the way they, they kind of used to talk about back in the day that you'd open this huge packet. It was a big packet you were in if it wasn't some denial letter. So I'm opening this letter and I'm like, oh. And then just the relief, you know, thinking of all the hard work that I had done, the, the summer of doing leadership stuff, all the going to conferences, just like you talked about going to BPA conference. Um, you know, I'm thinking of all the, all the work, you know, I didn't have a high ACT score, but I had worked to get my SAT score really high. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's finally, it's like, okay, I got in. And, um, wow. and so it, it was just a moment of relief uh, for me uh, in that moment. So that, that was what it, it was for me. Um, but I love hearing the stories of how everyone else feels. Um, and so that, that's, that's really cool that you got to, to have that and, and that your parents waited for you. I'm not sure I would have been able to get uh, my parents to wait for, or my grandfather to wait for me to open a package like that. Yes, sir. Well, that's, that's powerful. I enjoy that story. Now, um, not, not, being, not, not the part where you get accepted, but um, what is a, a moment? You talk about being in BPA and being a state officer. Is there a moment in student leadership that you would say was your all-time favorite moment? Oh, wow. That's um, student leadership. I would say yes. Um, so I, I was at Boys State, you know, the summer going into my senior year. I had a great time there, you know, met some great people. The week before I was at the West Point Summer Leadership Experience, it was a camp for rising juniors to go visit the campus, stay there for a week and, you know, see what it's like. So I had just left there and I was on my way to Austin. We were staying at University of Texas. Um, for the Boy State Leadership Conference. And for those of y'all who don't know what that is, it's just a, it's a conference where it's student-led, student-ran, and we all run our own government. So there's a governor, a lieutenant governor, um, there's a speaker of the house. We just learn about politics. And, you know, so my first day there, it was great. I was meeting people. I just love people. So I was talking to different individuals, just, you know, just kind of seeing where they come from. And, you know, the day came where they were like, okay, so what's everyone going to run for? And I was in the nationalist party and there was a nationalist and a federalist party. Right. So I was in the nationalist. I was like, you know what? I'll run for governor. I have nothing to lose. It was that type of thing, you know, which is a top position. Right. So sure enough, <laughs> I decided to run for it. Some people, I consider them my friends, you know, they're my friends, but they told me they're like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you want to do that, man? Like, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna do it, dude. I'm gonna do it. So that's something y'all need to be, um, you need to be cognizant of that. There are going to be people along the way, kind of chipping at your ear, you know, kind of discouraging you to chase something, but no, forget about that. Just do what's best for you. So, you know, regardless, I said, you know, I'm gonna go for it. So the first, <laughs> I remember the first time giving a speech, there were 18 of us giving a speech and think these are people going to, you know, university of California, lost UCLA, um, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you know, very intelligent people. And I was just, you know, in awe when I found out that out of those 18 people, I was the one chosen to run for my party. You know, it was crazy to me. 
I remember that first speech I won by about 40% of the votes, but we had to have a runoff because I didn't win by 50. And, you know, I ended up winning that one too. And, you know, these are great people. I still talk to them to this day, but it was just one of those things where it surprised me, you know, just to know my full capacity isn't what I had thought it was. So sure enough, I'm in the final, final election, the general election, and I lose by about 40 votes. And yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough. But I was excited to have gone through that. You know, we went through interviews. We were on broadcast shows. It was like, it was fun. It was a fun experience. And the guy I actually lost to, um, Sam Safranic. He's at the Air Force Academy right now. He's a great guy. I had met him the week before <laughs> at the West Point summer camp, you know? So we had already built that connection. I saw him. I'm like, he's from Dallas, Texas. I was like, dude, no way. Like, that's cool. So we were, we were good about it. We were good sports, but it was a great experience. And like I said, don't be afraid to fail. I failed on the largest scale, you know, in front of a thousand juniors in the state of Texas. And do I regret it one bit? Not at all. I would do it again if I had the chance. You know, yes, it, it stung not winning, but the stuff I've learned from doing that, it's important. You know, it's, it's big to me. Yeah, um, it's one of the coolest things, you know, boys from every part of Texas, they come together there to meet new friends at Boy State, American Legion. Bo I, I, I did Boy State, so it was one of my, the, one of the first conferences that I ever went to. Um, and actually, my college roommate was Lieutenant Governor of Texas Boy State. Um, so wow. in my college dorm, we had the big old, they give you a ridiculously huge, uh, like the the hammer thing that, uh, so we always had it in uh -huh. our room. It was up there on the mantle to, to, to to show off that he was the uh, lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor, of course. And uh, how was that for you, if, if you don't mind me? How was that for you? You know, I, I went in and I had no um, no guidance. Uh, my, my high school would pick one kid every year to, to go to Boy State, and they picked me. Um, I just showed up in Mercedes and at the American Legion there, and we took a bus with all these mm -hmm. other kids from the Valley. Um, but I had no idea. I'd never been to any conference. I didn't know that people run for things. So I showed up. I feel a little bit of a disadvantage because I didn't mm -hmm. have – uh, like a mentor to tell me, oh, when you go versus my roommate, he went, he was, he already had a game plan. He had a campaign plan before he ever showed up to Boy State. He knew that his goal was to become Lieutenant Governor so he could have that plaque and, um, and it, it puts you in, in great position, right? Cause it's, mm -hmm. it, it is a big award. It's a, it's a major leadership event. Um, so he was ready for that. He, he knew he was going for it um, versus I just showed up just to go. Um, so I always think of, you know, what, what kind of standard you talked about earlier, having a high standard, you know, he went in expecting to be there. I just went to go. So I was just becoming a member. He was like going to become the leader. Um, so I think that's part of like the kids who get to watch this later. Um, you know, they're, they're taking the time to invest in themselves so they can set that high standard. Um, and by, by listening to interviews, just like this, we're helping them to, to be that first, that leader that they're going to be later. Um, versus I was just going in just, going through the motions, being a part of a week because I was asked to do it. I wanted to represent my school, but I didn't know any of what to be expected. Um, and I'm a good public speaker. I wish I had known I would have probably done well maybe if I had expected or tried to do something like that. Yes, sir, it was just all part of the process, right? Um, but he definitely, my having it in my, in my room uh, all throughout college, anytime anyone went into our room, they were like, what is that? And he, he would tell the great story of how he was lieutenant governor and he talked about Boy State. Um, I do miss my shirt. Every once in a while, I'll see someone in the weight room working out with uh, the Boy State shirt. And I'm like, did you go to Boy State? Like, oh, no, my, my brother did. Or I'm like, oh, then you don't know. Uh, it was, it was a, cool, a cool week. It was my first conference that I ever attended. Yes, sir. The song, the song, too. <laughs> Just... <laughs> now, um, if someone out there wants to connect with you, what's the best way to connect with you? Um, is it Instagram, Facebook? How, how do you like to, to communicate with people out there? Okay, so um, you could reach me at basically, you know, anything. I mean, here, let me, so my, my, so my email is mariotrevino9 at gmail.com, right? So you can reach me there. And then at, here, let me see my, okay, my Instagram is mario underscore 33 underscore underscore and so i'd say those are the best best ways to reach me i just because i'm always i'm always on those those platforms but yes if anyone wants to reach me you know by any means 
I'll be, I'd love to, you know, just share what some of my experiences, you know, we've all failed and I feel that you can't fail yourself for everything. So that's where you ask other people for advice. And so just by all means, please feel free to, to reach out to me, whatever y'all need. Yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, those are some intimidating things, you know, to, if someone's thinking about going to West Point, you know, that's a big commitment. You're committing to not, not just go to the school, but uh, when you go to West Point, you commit to, you know, once you pass the two years, you're committing to um, be there in the military service for, for a little portion as well. Um, so I think that's one of the cool things um, about what the academies do, but also you were, you know, BPA, state officer, you know, almost governor by 40 votes. <laughs> um, but so any of you out there that if you ever want to, you know, learn from Mario, go ahead and shoot him a message. Um, Mario, what is your favorite uh, quote and how have you applied it to your life or, or to leadership? Oh, wow. This is, a, this is a good one. Okay, so my favorite quote. Mm. Okay, so I will offer one that's biblical and one that's from one of my favorite motivational speakers. So the one that's biblical is uh, James chapter one. I can't remember the exact verse, but you could look it up if y'all would like to. It goes like this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, for the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And you're going to need it, so you are not lacking, you know, anything. That's the, that final part. I kind of just free mouthed it right now. But that's something that always speaks to me. You know, because oftentimes people want to um, consider themselves a victim of a situation. But if God's putting you through that situation, he wants you to gain something from it. He wants you to be a better person because of it. You know, so instead of this is something that Inky Johnson always says, and this is uh, his next quote is or my next favorite quote is going to be from him. But he always says, um, don't ask why me, ask why not me. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes from him is that perspective drives performance, you know, because that's true every day of the week. You know, how you view what you do is going to determine how you do what you do. That's something he always says. And so I've always applied that to my life. I mean, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade, cleaning with my dad, you know, jan his janitorial business, how I viewed it always drove how I, you know, how I performed. You know, if I viewed it as, oh, I'm cleaning toilets, like, whoa, me mentality, then I'm not going to do a good job and I'm going to get in trouble. You know, my dad always held me to a standard. But if I viewed it like, you know what, I'm going to make this toilet, you know, where people come, they're having a bad day. They're going to see that toilet and they'll say, you know what, that, <laughs> whoever cleaned that did a good job. And that's just something I've always carried with me. So when adversity hits, you know, I try to remember that verse from James chapter one, more importantly, when I'm in adversity, I try to remember what Inky Johnson says that perspective drives performance. Yeah, you definitely took two of my favorite. Um, I'm, I'm, I've become friends with Inky Johnson. Uh, so I've gotten to uh, interact with him a few times at events. Um, and then, awesome. and, and I personally love watching the videos of, of like his speeches um, over and over. But then also uh, for me, one of the big moments of my life was coming to faith. Um, so, when I was just in middle school is when I made my commitment to faith, uh, when I became a Christian. And right after that is when I experienced where my mom went to prison, family got wow. split apart. Um, mm -hmm. But I always read the Bible. And because of quotes like that in the Bible, or seeing the stories of how these great leaders of the Bible, they experienced adversity first, and it actually prepared them for a moment later when they were in leadership. I took the adversity that I was going through in, in middle school and high school to be, okay, it's preparing me for some other great moment. You know, I'm only going through this because it's, it's testing me. It's, it's setting me up so that way I can have perseverance later on in life. Um, and so, and that gave me great strength. It gave me the ability to persevere in those moments. Uh, so I'm glad that you have that faith and you're taking that through everything that you're doing the rest of your life. Um, and I didn't know that your dad had that business that long ago. I thought that was a relatively new business that your dad had started. Um, <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. Yes, yeah, it's, it's been a while. It's been around for a while. I mean, we'd been there. Uh, my brother, you heard his ACL his freshman year. So it was my older brother, excuse me. So it was me and my dad a lot of the times, you know, 
coming out of football practice, whatever it may be, going to clean, you know, this location in Mercedes and, you know, just picking up McDonald burgers on the way, right? Just, you know, hungry, whatever. And, you know, just that's something that just motivates me so much because seeing where, you know, he was a coach, right? So he had this whole day of dealing with kids, you know, doing his job and he would come to clean with the intention of making it the best place you could, you could make it. And, you know, just seeing that, it really, it really drove me, you know, even now I draw that, I draw strength from that. You know, I'm up there, I have a 2,200 word essay due, a 1,000 word essay due, a math test, a chemistry test all in the same week. Like, you know what, like, how would my dad go about this? And I draw strength from that. So it's, no, it's, it's been great to see how he's, um, how he's used his work ethic in all aspects of life. But yes, yeah, sir, it's been around for quite a bit. And, um, Yesterday, he was showing me, yesterday, actually, he was showing me the locations. He was like, hey, uh, I want you to see this. And it was crazy because I remember there was a time where, you know, we were at one location, two location, and that was the world for us. You know, we were excited. We were happy. We were, we couldn't explain it. And then now, you know, seeing how the business is going good, you know, it's just, just all praise to God, honestly, it's what it is. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, can you tell us what what are your um, future plans after you finish your time at the academy? What what do you want to do career wise? Okay, yes, sir. So, um, my plans. I would like to. I'm um, right now. I'm gonna declare my major when I go back January twentieth, and I'm gonna declare chemical engineering. You know, then after that, I would like to get my MBA from Harvard, Yale, Princeton someday. You know, and then. After that, to be completely honest with you, I'm going to serve my five years in the army and I don't know what I would like to do. I mean, there's so many, so many avenues I could go. And I feel that, you know, when I do go through those phases, it's going to speak to me. It's going to say, Hey, you know, this is where you belong. So I'm just going to leave that open, but I don't know if I'm going to stay in for 20 years or leave after the five. And if I do leave after the five, I would like to, you know, go work with some big oil industry, or I don't know, maybe even go into politics. I feel that there's so many things you can do. It's, it's crazy right now. I'm just kind of taking it day by day, you know, just praying, seeing where, seeing where my future, where it lies. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think going to a school that's going to prepare you so well, not, not only um, for a career paths, but just life in general. I think when you go to a school that, that focuses so much on leadership and character and, and preparing you for so many different skills, it just opens up so many opportunities that um, you know the world is for years to take right now. So um, I commend you for all the hard work that you've done and everything like that. And I, I wanted to quickly before we um, before I put you to do the challenge part, um, but you know earlier when I asked you, you know what what are some ways that I can introduce you? You've accomplished so many amazing things, but you the things that you decided for me to introduce you with were about how you helped your dad's business, how you serve. And so, you know, just extra, you know, to your character, if we have in politics leaders who would think like that all the time, um, you know, I think you'd be great for the future of leadership like that in politics or whatever you want to accomplish. Now I'm going to, this is a part where I kind of put myself on mute. I put you on the spotlight. This is where uh, I'm not the motivational speaker anymore. Now Mario is the motivational speaker. Use the, those skills that you got. Uh, running for office to try to be governor um, to give a speech uh, and this would be for most likely it's uh, would be for student leaders so someone out there who wants to be a leader it'd be a challenge for them to be successful as a leader um, so Mario I'm going to put myself on mute really quick and uh, once I once I give you the thumbs up uh, that means that you have the full screen yes, sir let me see dude All right, hello everybody. As you all know, uh, my name is Mario Trevino. I'm currently a freshman at the United States Military Academy. And one thing, you know, actually three things, excuse me, three things that I want you to take from what I've said today. I want, I want to challenge you all a bit. You know, if you have not found your purpose, that's the one thing I want you to do. I want you to go out there and find your purpose. And that comes through failure. That comes through, you know, sitting with yourself in a room quietness and just asking yourself what do you want out of life those are the questions that you should be asking yourself because the sooner you get onto your journey 
the further ahead you're going to be, you know, there's power in that. You know, I truly believe that. And, you know, that excitement you have for that passion, this comes to the second point that I want to offer you all. That excitement you have for that passion, you need to bring it to all aspects of life. So, you know, me in football, I didn't do that my first two years of high school. I was one dimensional. I was all about football. You know, once I hurt my back, though, I started, you know, growing in my faith and, you know, I said, okay, this passion I have for football, let me start putting it in the school. Let me start putting it into helping others. Let me start doing this. And once that started happening, life just started opening doors. I never thought were, you know, imagine, imaginable to be open. It's, it's insane. You know, so that passion that you have, once you find it, you chase it. Right. And that excitement that you have in chasing it, you need to resonate that to different aspects of life, being the best brother, best sister, you know, best son, best daughter you can be. And so my third point is, you know, push it forward. Help people once you've gotten to that point where you're at the top of the mountain, help people that are trying to get there. You know, life is hard enough as it is. You don't need to be a burden to anybody else. You don't need to, you know, just be someone that people don't want to be around. You know, Inky Johnson says it all the time that they're just some negative people. And sometimes you're like, you know, I need to get away from this person. Don't be that person. You know, life is hard enough as it is. Be that light, you know, be the glory in the day. Be the smile that makes somebody's day, right? That's what I always try to say. That's what I try to follow. So, you know, if there are three things that, you know, you will take from what I've said, it's number one, just find your passion. Number two, that excitement that you have for your passion resonate it to every aspect of life and number three just push it forward everything you've learned everything you will learn you know your failures your your wins I mean just everything just push it forward and you now I would say that's my challenge for you all and you know you already know where to reach me Mario Trevino 9 at gmail.com you know any questions I'll have I'd love to answer them you know maybe even get on the phone or something but you know just Thank you. Thank you for this time. Honestly, I really appreciate it. And that's the utmost respect for you. You know, just hearing your story and what you've gone through. I mean, it's, it's great to be, um, it's great to be in contact with such, with such a great individual. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mario. Uh, again, you gave so much great advice and, you know, I, I, I use the word push all the time in my speeches. Uh, so anytime anyone else uses push, I love it. Um, and again, you, you quoted the Bible, you quoted one of my favorite speakers and a friend of mine, Inky Johnson. And then um, the last few years getting to know your mom and, and seeing all the work that she's done. I think I've also gotten to know your dad because I used to work for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and Westerco was one of my schools. So I'm sure at some point crossed paths with your dad. Um, and so just congratulations to all of your success, all the wonderful things that you've done. Amazing leader. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to, to give advice. Uh, to all the people out there, all the student leaders, all the future, um, you know, people that are going to go change the world. Um, and, and for you taking that time to do that today. Um, thank you so much. And I definitely, since we do live close on people out there may not know that we actually kind of live kind of close to each other. Um, when, when are you leaving town? Because I want to stop by and, uh, and meet you, shake your hand and, uh, and probably take some cookies. I think your mom said she would only make cook or she would buy them. She wouldn't bake them, but Right, you know, I'll take some cookies and take them over also. So I appreciate that. Thank you. No, I'm leaving January 15th. Okay. I have to be back January 16th, but <clears throat> uh, tomorrow my grandma came down from El Paso. So me and my dad, we're going to drive up there, go take her back. Um, and I'll be back Friday from that. So, so you said, I would love, I'd love to come in contact with you. I've always told my mom, you know, it, it would be great. And yes, sir. If you do have time, maybe we can meet up somewhere. You know, yeah, definitely, just, definitely. Um, I'll even we can go to Arby's if, if that's your absolute. <laughs> Arby's is great, yes, sir. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, Mario. You have a wonderful day. That's a long trip for the most people that don't know out there. It's like a 12 hour drive 12 from, hours, from yes, where sir. he's at to El Paso. He's doing it for his grandma, so that's awesome. Thank you again. Um, and I'll see you. Um, I'll, I'll connect with you and your mom, okay? Awesome, yes, sir. God bless, thank God you, bless, sir.